Yeah, I'm ready to go straight away. I'm going to do a quick little, uh, quick little piece. Then I'll screen share, so I've got it all, all ready to go. Whenever you are ready. Yeah, perfect. Um, happy to hand control over to you, um, and I'll just turn my microphone off and uh, video just so we get the best possible connection. Fantastic. Perfect. Cheers. Thanks, Sam. Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm assuming we are now live. I'm just quickly checking to see if we're live. Yeah, I think there's a wee bit of a delay, so I'll just continue. Um, so it's quite odd because look, there we are, we're on. Right, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I thought I'd wear a bit of topical top, a bit of Carol Baskin, a bit of Tiger King. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about time and eight secrets of success. I think you've had amazing speakers over the past two days, uh, past yesterday, sorry, and today and tomorrow and Joshua thank you so much for inviting me to speak so there's some fantastic speakers coming speaking all things property now we all know or a lot of people think that knowledge is power but knowledge isn't power knowledge is powerful beyond belief uh, however the power of that actually comes from the implementation of that knowledge and um, the taking of what you've learned and then using it and that you really need the correct mindset you need the right the mental picture and the right vision and the time to do it and that's what I see so many times time and time again people missing and the excuse i hear uh, again and again of why people haven't succeeded because everybody wants to succeed and to be successful but very very few actually do it very few implement the powerful knowledge that they've received in the true power of success and most will actually blame they'll blame anything they'll always blame something there'll be barriers in the way that they are blaming and the, the one that they blame the most is the lack of time and they say it as if to imply that if they had all the time in the world, they'd actually be a huge success. They'd actually be up there rivaling Richard Branson at the top. When in fact, if all of those distractions were taken away, if everything was taken away so they had all the time in the world, all that they would do is subsequently create more excuses. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to talk to you today about the uh, how you can best use your time and as I say, the eight secrets of success. So let me just quickly screen share with you. Hopefully now. Sorry for the slight delay in that. Okay, it seems that the where it is not there. Okay, so hopefully you should now see some slides there uh, i'm hoping you do uh, see a few slides there it's looking like it's coming on right so i'm not sure if we can see those at the moment is we're stuck on the um zoom window on uh -huh. safari right stand by how about that one yeah perfect we can see that now right fantastic so there we are. Zoom and me just do not seem to work at them recently, but there we are. So who am I? Uh, so I'm Richard Little. That was me uh, looking pre-COVID. Uh, but since this, since this lockdown started, I've kind of uh, developed a wee bit of facial furniture. Um, and I'm, I'm growing that a bit of a moustache. And most people now think I look like this fella here. So who am I? As I say, I've invested in property for over uh, 15 years. Should I? Uh, for over 15 years. What I'm going to quickly do is stop there as well stop my video get that so i've invested in property for over 15 years starting with kind of buy to lets and progressing through student hmos from 2007 onwards in in somerset in bristol in glasgow in edinburgh and then more recently in north yorkshire um, and really I, i've battered around the country i've done development commercial residential conversions um um, and all this time, all the time I was doing that, and then where I stand now is I've started a new company called Blue Oak, which is open, honest, and ethical, all the R3 things, and hopefully all of the, the watchers today are in the Blue Oak community. If you're not, I'll drop a link in later on. But we want to provide ultimate solutions for everybody to succeed. Now, you may look at that portfolio and think, my God, that's taken a lot of time to do, but all along, I was doing that while being a military pilot. And I've been a military pilot for the past 21 years. Um, in both the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. I was a frontline commando helicopter pilot um, for them, and I was also flown jets and deployed from Iraq war in 2003, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and kind of numerous other not so pleasant places around the globe. 
but I juggled that both hectic careers as a pilot in the Air Force and growing that property business and solving the problems that go with it. And actually, it's the problem solving that I love. I wasn't special. I, all I had was the right mental model to achieve what I set my mind to achieve. And that was done by a few key shifts in thinking, uh, which I won't cover in de those in detail today. I just want to cover the eight secrets. So how did I actually do that? As I say, the excuse I hear most of the time is, is lack of time. How did I manage that time being deployed all over the world in the not the non-conformatory nine to five job uh, that I was doing? I was all over the place. But the key is all in your mind. There's 1400 minutes in every day. And the thing that separates the successful from the others is the dedicated use of that time, becoming not only efficient, but effective with that time. Efficiency is the key. And that's what I'm really going to cover today. Efficiency is actually the key and becoming efficient allows you to greatly increase the working capacity and volume of effectiveness, which all of us can achieve in that allotted time. So I want to talk about the eight secrets of success. And they're not really secrets at all, but they are just eight keys to success. I haven't made these up. They've actually derived, derived from over 500 interviews with top uh, achievers and compiled by a chap called Richard St. John. Um, who presented these in a TED conference, but have subsequently been uh, used world over as the eight secrets of success. And they'll allow you to shift your mind into that implementation. Implementation of the knowledge, okay, which is knowledge is powerful, but it doesn't become power until you implement it. And these are all of the things which I implement on a day-to-day -day basis. And we'll start with passion. Many overlook passion in today's society, because they're bamboozled and they, they, they literally see on a day-to-day -day basis the social media get-rich-quick schemes, the shortcuts which are presented. Everybody wants a shortcut these days, yet they don't care what that shortcut is as long as it takes them to riches. And everybody on here, I'm sure, is, sees hundreds of them on a day-to-day -day basis from social media because that's where we all do. Well, firstly, money doesn't bring happiness. I'm sure we've all heard that before. It can make you happy, 100% it can make you happy, and Christ, Money can buy you a Ferrari and I'd far rather cry myself to sleep in a Ferrari. But success, um, but also success doesn't bring you happiness, but rather happiness brings success. And to be honest, that is so, so true. And when I realized that, things really, really changed on an exponential uh, path for me. So passion in property. Passion in property, I feel, is so overlooked. And many see a financial goal at the end, sold on the riches, thinking that property is this golden goose that will set them free. Yet not once do they sit back and look to see, are they passionate about what they hoped will bring them these riches, i.e. the physical medium of that golden goose, the physical medium that is property itself. And I realized very, very early on that I wasn't actually passionate about the refurbs, being on site every day, the renting of the properties or the day-to-day -day management of the tenants. I wasn't passionate about that, but I identified it early. What I was passionate about was solving the problems, okay? It was the problem solving that, that I was passionate about. And it was finding a solution that benefited everybody, both me, the vendor, and everybody involved. And the first time really I came across that, I was, uh, was looking at a block of flats, um, a block of seven one-bed flats, uh, which I still own today, um, which was as a repossession. And it went on as a guide of 100,000 pounds. Now, it, open source information told me that they had sold for 350,000 pounds a few years prior but the one is a guide of 100,000. So I went to, to visit that property, went on a viewing, and there were literally, they did three open viewings. There was about 100 people viewed the property over those few days. Now with that, there were people, there were builders measuring up, there was people who were looking at what they were gonna do to reconfigure these. It needed a full scheme of works doing. Um, and I just thought, I walked out there thinking, that's not, I'm not passionate about this because I'm not into that, into the, the day-to-day, the refer piece. Anyway, about two or three days later, an email went around uh, from the agent saying, and bear in mind that this was a time when, I know nowadays everybody's heard of Japanese knotweed, but this was seven years ago and nobody really understood the implications of knotweed. And lo and behold, there was Japanese knotweed found within seven meters of that boundary. So what that meant is technically that property was worthless. So I thought, right, I'm going to find out how to solve this problem. And I set about looking to find the solution to this problem. And at that time, there was one company within the UK who would solve that. Uh, a company in Manchester came across and they would put a treatment plan in place. And as I say, this is 
it's all very common now, but at the time, nobody would ever done this or heard of it, or very few people had. Anyway, I thought I'm going to throw a bid in. I scared a lot of people off. Out of those 100 viewers, there were five people bid. And I put a bid in of just over £100,000, 112500 And I was invited to a second round of bidding, and I eventually won that property for 117000 I bridged into it. I put a treatment plan on that property the very next day, which cost me £1,500. And it was revalued by a mortgage company of which, uh, on a bridge to term product, of which I've still got the same uh, product at £350,000. And I bridged in at 100. So, what was that? What actually happened? I wasn't passionate about, um, I wasn't passionate about that property. I was passionate about the problem to which I was solving. And it's that once I identified where my passion lay, actually has taken me on another step. As Starbucks founder Howard, so it's, it's really, really important that you know what your passion is. And as I say, as Starbucks founder Howard Schultz once said, when you surround yourself by people who share a collective passion and a common purpose, anything is possible. So passion is vital, but even more vital is sharing it, expressing it, talking about it and identifying your passion early to surround yourself with the right people. And that is very, very true today. And that's what I encourage everybody to do. Um, and as I say, that's what our vision was by starting Blue Walk. Identify your passion in property. So next up is work. Okay, so work. Again, I'll start with a, a little quote by Richard Branson, who s simply said, to be successful, put your head down into something and get goddamn good at it. An insatiable work ethic is needed. Um, whatever you're going to do, you've got to have an insatiable work ethic to get through things. And they are learned. An insatiable work ethic is learned. You're not born with it. It's learned through habits, routines, and a cast iron vision and a why. Uh, we've all heard of the 10,000 hour principle or athletes and people in the top of their field uh, become masters through 10,000 hours or repeat something 10,000 times. And it's often forgotten in today's world where immediate gratification is what everybody wants. With a world at our fingertips so quickly on mobile devices and can get anything so, so fast. You know, you can order something on Amazon Prime and have it delivered tomorrow. However, we can't get success quickly. And as a result, the younger generation and people now are becoming programmed to expect immediate results and everything with immediate gratification. But that is not the case with success. You don't become an overnight success without putting in 30 years of work prior to that. You don't plant a seed and expect to come back to a tree the very next day. The trouble is, however, with these immediate results, the vast majority of people give up. When I first started investing in property, uh, I was about to deploy to Iraq in 2003, which was the actual invasion of Iraq for the war. That was a very, very stressful time, a very tense time of a, an era that nobody really knew what was going on. We were going into an arena that we, none of us had been in before. Yet I still managed to move forward because I was just starting my property journey at that time. And I still managed to move forward. And why? It was simply because it was a work ethic that was formed through harness and true discipline and focus. True peak performance where no barriers, no excuses got in the way other than a work ethic to get me to the other side. Focus. Nothing focuses the mind more than time. And I think too many people overlook this. We've all been given a terminal sentence, okay? Every single person has been given a terminal sentence and we are ultimately going to die. And I think too many people overlook that and think it's a little bit dramatic, but it's not. Because we've been given a terminal sentence yet we just don't know if it's 60 minutes or 60 years. Uh, very few take notice of that until it becomes finite. And the reality of your human fragility is thrust into your face in its raw state. And that's when you start to focus. And that's when you start looking at the need to take action or the need uh, to do something about it. But quite often that's too late. Look at the situation in where we're in now. Nobody expected us to be locked down for the past, you know, where are we now? God, seven weeks I think we're in. And all of a sudden that, that realization of, hang on a second, we have a limited period of time, so we need to get on with it. So value your time every day as if you never know when that terminal sentence will actually come to fruition. Don't make things too complicated, though. Just get on with it. You know, there are genuinely only seven colors. There's seven colors in the rainbow, but there's been thousands of beautiful paintings ever made. Okay, so just get on with things. You've got to get moving. You've got to be fast. And don't wait to do things. Just get on with them. Be a fast mover and get started. Start create, Starting physically creates that focus. 
If you need to be right before you move on something and start something, you will never actually achieve it because trying to be perfect and perfection is the enemy of progression. Speed, getting moving will trump perfection every single time. People these days are too afraid of making that mistake. Everyone's afraid of the consequences of error, but a greatest error is not actually getting moving. You will fail, but, the re but you will fail along the way. All that happens is you learn from those failures. Um, the realization of that will develop actual macro focus, okay? Macro focus that you can then turn into micro focus on a day-to-day -day basis. How am I doing for time here? I've got plenty of time. Right, drive and passion. I've kind of lumped these ones two to, these two together, um, and hopefully you'll see a defined uh, separation too, but drive and passion. And drive really comes from the size of your why. We've all heard that before, and I'm not really going to go into it now, but you've got to make those big goals. Make those big goals that seem unachievable to the average. We've all written them down. We've all heard this before, but we, you've got to do it. If you haven't got that goal, you'll just drift around. There's no rush to get to that end point, and I think too many people are in a rush to get to that end point, like I said earlier on, in this social media generation that we now live. But you have to start. You've got to have those micro goals along the way, which will always ultimately drive you towards that large, large goal. And it's the micro goals that I, I spend a lot of time talking about. The micro goals allow you to see tangible movements towards that big end goal. Because if you haven't got them, you may not actually see on a day-to-day -day basis movement towards that big end goal. You've got to aim high. as Mark. Um, you've got to aim high. A lesson, persistence is a lesson that everyone's got to learn. And it's, it's a need to persist when times are difficult. Everything is easy when there's no barriers. When everything's perfect, the conditions are perfect persistence is easy but when the conditions are poor and there's many barriers that's when we experience defeat and rejection and the easiest thing to do is actually give up and many many people do and it's through that time where you've got to grow a mind grow in your mental state the persistence that you've got to grow strong enough to persist through that adversity chasing those big dreams like i've just mentioned requires persistence and setting the goals and the dreams is fun and as i say everybody tells you to do them and you sit down and you do them, you write them down, and you th they make you feel good because you think you've achieved something. But at that point, you're just a dreamer, okay? Because that's all you are unless you start. We'll tell all the effort and time needed is often much more than initially thought to achieve those. And so often than not, people give up and decide, that let's take an easier route or a shortcut, like I've said before. However, at least they did dream. They dared to dream, okay? They started chasing that dream, but what they lacked was the courage, imagination, and persistence. If I've got time, I'll tell a quick story about the one time that I, the thing which I admire most in persistence. It was a quick story of when, again, I was deployed. I tell a lot of stories about when I was deployed uh, with the military because they're, they're, they're quite powerful. And in 2009, um, there was a 12-year-old girl, 12-year-old girl in, uh, in, on the, the Pakistan-Iraq border. And she wanted to attend school. She, she was 12 years old, bear in mind. All she wanted to do was go to school. But under Taliban control, um, they did not allow females. They did not allow girls' education. So she disguised herself under a pseudonym and started going to school. So at 12 years old, she was putting her life on the line every single day to go to school. And she started writing a blog, a blog that went viral on the BBC because she felt that girls deserved their education. Um, and she wanted to share her plight with the world. She wrote about the topics every single day, ranging from her vision, her drive, her passion to be a doctor, but also the fear that her school would be targeted if she was ever found out. For the first time, people actually outside of that arena started to see a first-person account of a Taliban rule from a perspective of a young girl in there, 12 years old again, don't forget. Anyway, one day an American reporter, uh, while we were there, asked her for an interview and they made a documentary about her. Now, unfortunately, that documentary then went viral uh, and the Taliban soldiers uh, saw that documentary. And I'd say you may have seen this on the news because it was quite well documented. But they boarded her school bus one morning uh, and they shot her both in the head and the neck. So 12 years old that they went on the bus and they shot her. She didn't actually die that day, and she was uh, rushed to hospital in country. She was airlifted to a hospital, and then she was subsequently airlifted back to the UK. Um, but after that attempt on her life, most people, understandably, would have given up.
but her quest was for girls' education. That experience not only strengthened her when she recovered from her wounds, but it made her more persistent to pursue the dream that she had that all girls should have education. And within, e within weeks of that, two million people in that country had signed a right to education bill. The country's first right to free and compulsory education was passed, and she actually won the Nobel Peace Prize before she was 18. Now, we haven't all got the Taliban chasing us, okay? That's a bit of an extreme story there for most of us. But what we have got is a vision. We all should have a vision that we deeply, deeply care about. And our willingness to persist and manage whenever obstacles are in front of us, even if that opposition appears insurmountable, is often the most important thing to success. And that level of persistence is what we should all have. And everybody, whenever the chips are down, whenever you feel that there's a barrier in the way, think back to a story like that. That's all I ever do when I come into a hard time. I think back to a story like that, that a 12-year-old girl has a persistence like that. And actually, that reinvigorates me. Right, productivity. Got a couple more minutes. Uh, productivity. What is productivity? Um, I'm going to do a quick little six points here because productivity is the one thing out of these eight today that you can change over in a, in a heartbeat like that. And it's the one that I think all of you watching both yesterday and today with all of these great speakers should implement straight away. So many think productivity is actually the measure of efficiency of a person completing a task. That productivity means getting more things done each day. And you're absolutely wrong. Productivity is getting the important things done consistently. And no matter what you're working on, there is only a few things that are truly important. Being productive is about maintaining a steady average speed on a few things and not max speed on everything. It's about time management. Uh, it's not about time management, sorry. It's about attention management. Time management is not the solution. As I said earlier on, there's only 1,400 minutes in every day. And if you focus on time management, all it makes you aware of is how many of those minutes you are wasting. A better option is attention management. Prioritize the tasks and the projects that matter to you, and it won't matter how long anything actually takes. Because attention management is the art of focusing on getting things done for the right reasons in the right places and the right moments. So quick six steps that I am going to give you to improve your immediate wins now. So these are quick wins now on the topic. Um, and then all of the other seven, eight, the eight, seven secrets will come over the next few days. But these you can implement straight away. Manage your energy, not your time. You're better at doing certain tasks at certain times of the day. So find out when you are at peak energy. Don't do an important task when you are at low energy. Use the productive hours that you have for the most important tasks. Turn off your phone, at least the notifications. That's massive for me. Everybody, like I say, everybody these days has notifications on their phone. And if you're distracted by that, it then takes you longer to get back into that working zone and working environment. Set out with a good morning routine, a tiny routine that signals your brain that it's time to work. Uh, that is key. It may be exercise, it may be work, whatever it is, but set that routine and keep going with that routine. It doesn't have to be the 5 a.m. club that seems to have Facebook fame, okay? Don't do that if that doesn't fit with your body. If you want to get up at 7 o'clock and set that routine, as long as it's a routine and that you build good habits upon that routine, then that works for you. Don't listen to what other people are doing on the social media platforms. Set a morning routine that works for you. Plan, okay? Planning your day and planning the work is critically, critically important. If you set aside 10 to 15 minutes at either the end of the day or the beginning of the day to decide what tasks need doing that next day, I personally write two lists. I write the first list of every task that needs to be done the following day. Then I extract six things from that list, which are the important ones. And they then become, they have my micro focus, okay, for the following day's activity. But time spent planning, we used to say in the military, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. The time spent planning enables you to work efficiently and effectively the following day, either at the end of the day or the beginning. I personally do it at the end, and then I shut down the office and that's it done. Eat the elephant, okay? If we have a big project to do, 90% of people will put that project off because if they start it, actually moving towards the end of that big project, they don't really see a tangible movement because they haven't set micro goals. But however big it is, you've got to start. Break it down into bite-sized chunks, hence eat the elephant. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. 
that's all you need to do. So let's break every task down into micro chunks. And every one of those micro chunks that we subsequently achieve becomes a micro goal that we've won. Every time we hit one, we've won a separate section of every day. And however big that task may seem, as long as you start, fear, overwhelm, doubt, rapidly, rapidly fade away. And the final one, review. Debrief at the end of the day, your successes, where you were efficient, but also where you were inefficient. Yes, pat yourself on the back and say, well done me, I've had a good day, but also look at how you can improve going forward uh, into the next day. But like I said at the start, knowledge is powerful, okay? As long as the action is taken to carry these things out. Um, yeah, so we've got to take that action to get moving through them. Last couple of slides, you've got to be efficient. Uh, time, use time effectively, you've got to be efficient. And I love that quote by, uh, by Bill Gates. I choose a lazy person to do a task. Become efficient that you want. Cut out the dross. Cut out anything that doesn't need to be there. Analyze it, debrief each day, and plan the next. We're very nearly there because this is the last one. And it's serve and do good. Um, the bottom line is, um, it's what we're here for, okay? to serve and give back. Aristotle once said, what is the meaning of life? And it is to serve and do good to others. Long before you think you can, you should be serving and giving back. By doing so, you realize that there's actually greater things than material objects, but often we realize this far too late as we wait until we have the time or the spare money to give back. We wait until it's almost too late. To serve others is the greatest gift anyone can give, give and bring levels of contentment and happiness uh, that potential material object can't. But like I said at the start, knowledge is powerful. Take in all the knowledge that's been given over these few days, okay, in order to move forward. Uh, implement it and become powerful. And use that knowledge that you're gaining to pass to others, to serve others, to give to others, okay? Stop putting barriers in the way. Use these eight secrets of success um, to your benefit. Because if you implement all of them, Okay, you will see a marked improvement on where you are going. It's what we're trying to do with, with peak performance as part of uh, Blue Oak. Um, with P Blue Oak Peak Performance, uh, which is a, an arm of Blue Oak. But ultimately, um, use those eight things. Look at your day-to-day, -day, implement the, uh, the productivity that you can do today, and hopefully you can then put into action all of the lessons that you are about to learn from some of the fantastic speakers you're about to hear. I think if I stop sharing my screen. Joshua, there we that are. That was a yeah, really good presentation. I was most people done some like especially those quick wins as well. You know, it's when you say it like that, it just sounds so easy and obvious, but then it's kind of oh yeah, that really makes sense. And you start doing that with the yeah. phone as well, you know, notifications, they just really interrupt your chain of thought. Um, and it can really kind of hamper your, your day. I've um, got a couple of questions. So you mentioned um, kind of getting your vision in place. Um, how do you capture your vision? So if you've got something in your head, how do you turn it into something tangible so you can refer back to it at a later time yeah, so, so it keeps you kind of motivated and on track? And I think what, what, what I find that people, where people lack with the, the motivation and the lose track of it is because they'll write these big goals, they'll write these visions down, and I always think you've got to write it down. Okay, if it's not written down, it's not real. So write the thing down first. But if it's big enough, what, what I find is people will start up out in that journey to achieve it, but because it's so big, your day-to-day -day steps, you can't see a tangible movement towards this goal. Okay, so it's important that when you've got that, you take a little bit of time to break that down break that down into a five year, a 12 month, and then a monthly progress into those what I call micro goals. Because if you have those micro goals, every time you achieve one, it may be a month period for that micro goal. You see a tangible movement. You see something that you can hang your hat on. I am moving towards that big goal. Because if you don't see that tangible process, a progress, if you've just got this big goal up here somewhere, when the chips are down and it gets hard and there's a barrier in the way, that's when people give up because they don't see progress towards it. So you've just got to start by writing that thing down and then being analytical about breaking that down into, into key micro goals. And every one of those micro goals you celebrate as a success. 
Absolutely. Um, I've got another question that kind of just comes off the back of that. Do you mm. believe in um, journaling, so keeping a journal of these kind of things? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I, I've, I've been through phases of journaling in my time. I don't now. I see the massive, massive power in it. I have in the past. If I'm brutally honest, I wish I had. It's a regret that I've got that I didn't journal a lot of things because now my memory is actually quite bad. Uh, so I have to have forgotten a lot of things and it, it needs others around me who've kind of been with me um, to kind of remind me of those things. So I wish, if I'm brutally honest, for the past 20 years, I had kept a journal. It's massively powerful. It doesn't have to be time consuming. Uh, and I would encourage people to do it if it fits. I'd say it's a regret of mine that I didn't, but I don't. I do see the power. Uh, yeah, well, I hope that certainly answers that question. Uh, Scott, I want to hear from Sharon. So what do you see as success? Do you think it starts with the mind? 100%. Yeah, 100%. I've been through periods of my time when it was material objects. It was achieving something. It was buying a car. It was having something. So that's, for me, that's kind of early juvenile, juvenile measures of success are driving a car. You know, mine was I wanted to drive a Bentley. So when I made that, I drove a Bentley. And what happened is, at the time, in my head, I thought, I'm successful. That rapidly wore off, that very, very quickly wore off because it was a sugar high. It was a material object, which I'd thought will bring me happiness and it didn't. So success does come in the mind. Success comes with challenging you and, and it's easy to measure when you've got a big goal so you can measure your own success. Uh, but as I say, it took me years to get out of the, the whole material objects bring happiness and success. I'm successful if I have this or have that. It's not about what you have, it's about who you are. Well, absolutely, yeah. Um, so I want to hear from Diana. Um, what advice would you give your young self um, if, when starting property in life? Right, so start. It's, I mean, you've got a perfect platform here. You've got three days that, Joshua, again, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. A perfect platform to educate yourself. Education is key. So education is key, 100%, can't doubt that. The mindset, where people struggle with the mindset starting in property as a youngster is generally self-doubt uh, or they'll put barriers in their own way. So always, always be working on your mindset. Always do that. Jump across, as I say, I've, I've dropped a link into our peak performance and our Blue Oak page. Jump across there. We couple the pair of them with property education where everything is free. We have everybody's best interest at heart to provide ultimate solutions for everybody to succeed. Coupled with that, we've got the peak performance element, which is designed to work on everybody's mind and everybody's own self to move forward. So if you've, you've got to put the two pieces together. So education is key, but you must be working on that mind to get over the barriers that are there. Self-confidence is important, but there's also a very fine line between confidence and arrogance. And that's something I talk quite a lot about. Um, but the key, I think, for her, if I gave one bit of advice, is start. And she's started by watching this morning. So I encourage you to watch until the end of tomorrow and absorb as much as you can. Yeah, certainly echo with that. Make sure you're watching the whole thing. Um, so you mentioned just there about Blue Oak. Um, yeah. You very kindly offered um, to donate a Blue Oak Mastermind Day. Um, yeah. What we're going to do is, I think, how much would, would you usually sell that? Could you put a price on it? Um, I'm sure it's kind of... I would say to get myself, Paul and Andy in one room with t-shirts like this is priceless. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we don't really, we, we only have a, we run a mastermind, a very, very exclusive mastermind called our expedition program. We don't sell anything else. We are very, very uh, keen in blue up to share information, share as much as possible. So we don't sell on tax days or mastermind days. We sell a, a, an expedition program and a day with us on an expedition program. I say that's a very exclusive, gets a lot more content. They would charge, we charge a thousand, pretty much a thousand pounds per day for that. So you could argue that that's what it would cost. You will yes, get absolutely. Well in excess of a thousand pounds. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to say that, you know, we've been talking for about half an hour and the value there is, is incredible. So a whole day, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot of value to that. Well, you know what, Joshua, I've just literally realised that uh, I had in my clock finishing at 9.45, where I'm not, I was supposed to finish at 10 o'clock. So I rushed through those last <laughs> few slides. I got my time frame completely wrong. Uh, that's all right. Uh, we've got a few more questions, so it yeah. works out well. Um, so what we're going to do is... Yeah, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to say minimum donation, £25, um, to get a chance of winning that, that mastermind day. All you need to do is make a donation to the Virgin Giving page 
send a screenshot of your new £25 donation. If you donated yesterday for Chris Hamilton and any of the other guys, this is a new event. So you've got to donate a new £25. Send a screenshot to Joshua at JSM Partners with the subject of Blue Oak. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to pick a, a winner at random. Um, and then we'll pass your details on to Rich and the guys. And you'll get a day at Blue Oak uh, kind of running, running through everything you need to know. We will uh, look after them. That's it. I've just dropped in there. Please do, if you're not part of the, the Blue Oak community, do so. We're, we're running a peak performance. So I talk a lot about peak performance. I'm a very big believer in what are called marginal gains. Um, so if you broke your day down into very, very all different items and improved everything by 1%, the collective gain would be fantastic. And that's known as marginal gains. It was coined by a fella, Dave Brailsford, for the, the English cycling team. So tomorrow, and that's what we do with peak performance. We really want to work on people's habits, their focus, their discipline, um, their routines. And that's what that whole thing, accountability is key. A lot of people now in the property world use the word accountability, but they don't use it, you don't hold people accountable correctly because accountability is actually understanding the consequences of not doing that action. So if there's no consequence of you not doing that action, then if you don't do it, nobody will notice. So and that's what's holding people accountable. So what I mean by that is, you know, when I was in the military, the consequence of not doing something may well have resulted in somebody losing their life. In property, the consequence of you not doing 10 viewings that week or not putting in those offers will ultimately result in you not achieving that goal, that big goal that you may have set yourself. So once you've identified those consequences, okay, you can then be held accountable. And as I say, at Blue Oak, with myself, Paul and Andy, we hold people directly accountable. We drive that accountability and ask them why they haven't done that and then drill down into those reasons why. We're running a webinar tomorrow night. Um, I'll drop a link in. Everybody's welcome to come. Please come along and have a little listen to what we aim to achieve with peak performance and how we, how everybody should have it in their lives and how we can assist you by growing that. So please come along to the webinar tomorrow night. Uh, join the two Facebook groups. Donate to the fantastic charity and this event because the amount of work that you must have put in to put this together is phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you on that one. Um, so, yeah, we've still got a, kind of a couple more minutes left. Uh, so we just try and get through a couple more questions just while people get the opportunity to donate, get their £25 in, bit.ly forward slash help the NHS. Um, email it over to me and get yourself on that mastermind day um, or mentoring day. Um, so we've got a question here. So what's your morning routine? So my morning routine will be, so I've got a, uh, I've got a two, uh, well, he's three next month. So quite often it's dictated by him because he's, uh, <laughs> quite frankly, you know, I've been in some very nasty places in the world, but not one of them beats you up quite as much as a three-year-old boy called George, who looks like he's a prop forward already. So what is my routine? You know, my routine is literally to, uh, you know, I'll rise usually at six. I'll do a, sm a bit of exercise then. I actually do breathing exercises. Um, so I'll do a lot of people probably have heard of like the Wim Hof breathing. I do a bit of Wim Hof breathing for 10 minutes, exercise. And then at that point, I will try and read. That's my reading point in the day. I will try and read. Sometimes that slips because of George. But if not, it's simply a 6 a.m. exercise, breathing, and then it depends on him. If I don't read then, then I will allocate a slot in my working day of 20 minutes to read. And I always do that. I'll, I'll try and read two types of books. I'll read a book that I want to improve, like a mindset book or something that I'm into, something that I enjoy reading. But I'll also have kind of a textbook, if that makes sense. So at the minute I'm reading one, I, I love uh, the economics of like money, economics of the markets, that sort of thing. So I will then read a textbook uh, during the working day. So it's not a, it's not a light read. It's a, it's a heavy read, but it's a very, very educational read. And I'll allocate 10 to 20 minutes in my working day to read that because that is what I would consider work. So, yeah, that's my morning routine. But it's also not just, you know, that morning routine sets me up. But I also have routines throughout everything I do um, from working, from working efficiently. That's all a routine and that's a habit. You've got to have the routine initially until it becomes a habit. So a lot of people think, again, they'll produce this routine overnight, then all of a sudden their life will change. It's not. You've got to do that routine consistently every single day repetitively until it becomes a habit and you no longer think about it. How long do you think it takes for something to become a habit 
in your experience? You know, again, there's those, there's the scientific things behind that. You know, some will say you've got to do it a hundred times. There's two weeks, there's things like that. You've, for me, you've got to kind of, you've got to do it long enough to have weathered the storm. So for me, what I mean by that is if your morning routine is going for a run and you started in July and you run throughout July for a month, that doesn't cement that as a habit because you haven't had the, the winter months. And what, what do the winter months bring? They don't just bring bad weather, they bring barriers. And all that's going to happen is you're going to put those barriers in the way. So you've, you've, it's the consistency. Don't think you've got to do it every day. If you do it every other day, then that's fine. You've just got to start. So to answer that question, I think it all, the, for me, it's the environment you're in will di dictate how long that habit become, how long that habit takes to cement itself in your being. Yeah, uh, yeah, certainly agree with that. Um, so going back to the book, so what two books are you reading at the moment? Um, let me have a little look up there. I'm looking, I'm trying to read the one at the moment. The, so the, there's the power of, I'm reading one, um, I can't remember its name now. So it's the, um, the change in the economic cycle is the textbook book read. Uh, and I'm reading yep. another one there, The Power of Habit. Again, just an easy uh -huh, one. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. yeah, I'll read, but I'll also listen. So I listen to books, books that I've almost that I've, I've done a few times to get them in. So say if I go running or something like that, one of my favorites is The Compound Effect, which I must have listened to about five or six times. So even though I've heard it before, I'll continue to listen to it. I'm a massive fan of Daniel Priestley books. Um, so he has one um, currently oversubscribed, which I'm just about to uh, start listening to. I'm a real fan of, of his books. They're kind of what I would consider the easy reading books that I would try and read in the morning, mornings. And then, as I say, I've got one, I say it's about economics. And don't get me wrong, you do two pages of that and you, you are spent. But it's, it's knowledge which I'm, I try and put in. And hence why I set aside kind of 10 to 15 minutes in the working day to do that, rather than light reading in the mornings. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the compound effect, I think that was even available free on YouTube, a whole copy of the audio book. So I definitely recommend that one. Mm. Um, so I know you've kind of touched on it, but what's, the, what's your kind of favourite book, if not one of the two you just mentioned? I would say my favourite book in that subject is The Compound Effect. It is yep. The Compound Effect. Now, another book um, um, that I do enjoy, I'm trying to think of the name. I do a lot of um, sport parachuting uh, and, and skydiving. Now, there's a book by a fellow called Dan Bronsky Chenfeld, and I think it's called Above All Else. Okay. Now, it's, it's written in a sporting field, so he's a sportsman. He was a top-class a class, class athlete. However, reading that book and, and transposing the, the, men, the mindset piece that he talks about in that book is phenomenal. And I think I'd encourage people to do that as well. We all try and read these mindset books or these educational books to grow ourselves as people that are in the field of either mindset or in property or in business. But actually broaden your horizons. If you read some of the autobiographies of some great sportsmen, you know, those people who are at the peak of their, their field, you'll actually learn probably a lot more 